Saxon Algebra 2, Lesson 88. Distance formula is the first half of our lesson today. And this is a fun formula because what we're basically doing is taking two older, familiar formulas and we're putting them together to make a new one. So let's start by looking at a triangle. We're gonna graph a pair of points on here and then we're gonna draw a triangle between them. We're going to use these two points. So go ahead and just graph those two points. Nothing fancy or difficult about that. If you're comfortable with kind of sketched out graphs, feel free to just draw them on your paper. If you're the kind of person that really prefers for them to be perfect, get some graph paper. Okay, and then of course I just use my blue lines on the y-axis, right? Remember, this is the y-axis and this is the x-axis. Okay, so minus five plus three. This point is right about there. And four minus two, this one's down here. Okay, remember we can also label these x1, y1, x2, and y2, right? That's, that's perfectly fine to do. We did that with our slope formula. Now let's draw the triangle that connects these two. Okay. Now, I want to call this, as we labeled it here, but I want to use x1. Oh, I did this wrong. This should be an x1, y1. x1, y1 x2, y2 down here. Now, we know that when we have a right triangle, we can also use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for any missing sides. This side we can call A, this side we can call B. Of course, we know we can call them by either letter as long as the two legs are the A and the B. The hypotenuse has to be the C. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Pythagorean. Pythagorean theorem is what it's typically called. It's just a formula. And we know that if you square one leg and square the other leg, that will equal the square of the hypotenuse. Uh, this is familiar. We know how to plug numbers in and solve. And we know that um, you can change the side. So I can write it this way, right? I can just pick it up and flip it over. And we know that if we're trying to solve for C, we can take the square root of both sides. And we can write that as a formula if we want. We can write it as an alternative. We can write C equals the square root of A squared plus B squared. Okay, these are the same. This is just another form of it. And for our purposes, this is gonna be helpful. C is the hypotenuse, A and B are the legs, and this picture helps us visualize what C does. C goes directly from this point to the other point. Okay, that's cool. Now, let's talk about a different friend. Let's talk about slope formula. I think that was just last lesson, wasn't it, 87? And what we learned is that if you have a pair of points, you can calculate the slope. Right, and there's the formula that we use. Now, I'm not interested in the M part of this. I'm just gonna kind of cross that out. We're ignoring that. I'm interested in these two expressions because I wanna look at the values of those compared to the values of A and B. Let's go back to this. Let's calculate how long side A is. And again, we can just count the units on the, this for A, we'll count on the y-axis, right? The bottom point is down here, so we go up. One, two, three, four, five. It is five units long. 
There's no plus or minus to it. That The side of that triangle is five units long. B is this distance. So let's count that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's nine units along the base of that triangle. Okay, beautiful. Now let's go back to this and let's look at these separately. I don't care that much that they're in a fraction. Let's use our same points. We can look at the um, we can look at the triangle, but we've got them written out right here. So let's try those. And again, we don't care that they're in a fraction. We're just looking at them separately. Y two is minus two. Y one is three x2 is 4, and x1 is minus 5. Minus 2 minus 3 is minus 5. 4 plus 5 equals 9. Look what happened. If you compare this, you will see that the change in the y values is the same distance as side A. And the change in the X values is the same distance as side B. Huh. So these expressions of Y2 minus Y1, that's equal to A. So the change in the y values is equal to a. Oh, interesting. The change in the x values, which we wrote this way, that is equal to b. That's not just a fluke that it happened this way in this problem. That's the way it will always work out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy some things to the next page. I'm going to copy this expression. C equals the square root of A squared plus B squared. And then I'm going to write that we figured out that A equals the change in the Y's and B equals the change in the X's. That's what we figured out here, right? We did these calculations and we found out that they're exactly the same as A and B. So now what we're going to do is substitute this expression for A into this formula and this expression for B up here. We're almost done. So now we can say that C equals, instead of A, we're writing this, Y2 minus Y1 squared plus, and now instead of B, we're writing X2 minus x1 squared. We're almost done. The hard part is done. The last thing I want to do is I want to change this expression. It's true. We can think of this distance c, this side c, we can think of that as the hypotenuse of the triangle, but we can also describe this side of the triangle as the distance between point x1, y1 and point x2, y2. So instead of calling it C, which is kind of a Pythagorean thing, we're gonna call it D. I'm gonna copy this down here. We're just changing the name of it. This is our new friend, and it's called the distance formula. And what it allows us to do is take two pairs of points. We don't have to graph them like we did here. We don't have to go through this whole thing of graphing them and drawing the picture and counting out the sides. If we use this formula, we can go directly from the points themselves and calculate the distance. So it's Pythagorean theorem and slope formula pushed together. How cool is that? I'm, I mean, I'm excited, obviously. I think it's great fun. 
So let's see how it works in practice. Ready? This is our boy. And I hope you can see it's kind of easy to memorize because you think, okay, well, it's Pythagorean theorem rearranged. It's a squared plus b squared. But a, we now describe as the change in y values. And then we add, we square it and we add, just like we do in Pythagorean. And then b is the change in the x values. And again, square it. So this stands for a and this stands for b. We take the square root because that's what we did to rearrange Pythagorean. Now we're ready to dive right in and use this in a problem. And the problem, there's only one with this. Use the distance formula to find the distance between 4 minus 2. Oh look, it's the problem we were already working. How did I know? Minus 5 and 3. We're not going to draw, draw the graph. We're not going to graph any points. We're simply going to use these values and plug them in here. Let's do this. x1, y1, x2, y2. So the distance between these two points, we drew it before as side c, but now we're just saying we're calculating the distance. It is kind of a monster to write out. It is 3 minus minus 2. Ooh, 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 ooh. We better use some buckets, right? 3 minus minus 2, and then that is squared. These are the big parentheses, right? Plus x2 minus 5 minus x1, 4. Now I'm going to show, oh, and this is squared. Now I'm going to show you why the plus and minuses don't matter. Remember, I kind of ignored that minus on the last page. We're going to square these numbers. Let's just take it through. This will be 3 plus 2. That becomes 5 squared plus minus 5 minus 4 is minus 9 squared. That one's got big roomy buckets, doesn't it? Now, you might get worried and go, oh my gosh, we've got a negative number. This is a problem. No, it's not because we're going to square it. 5 squared is 25. Negative 9 squared is 81. Once we square these, the plus and minus doesn't matter. That's why I was able to ignore it on the other page. And you were probably shocked and horrified at my loose calculation. But that's why, is because once we get further into the calculation, everything gets squared. That makes the minus signs go away. Everything's happy. Our almost final step is to add these. That's 106. And then we better just check to see if we can uh, break this down at all, right? Can we uh, simplify this radical? So I'm going to think about 106. I'm going to divide it by 2, and that would be, what, 53? 2 is prime, and 53 is also prime. Um, I want you to think and puzzle on these numbers, but if you're ever stuck, just Google, is 53 a prime number? Or is 53 prime? And that will be a way you can check on that, right? I want you to think about it first. I don't want you to just become some lazy mathematician that just Googles the answer to everything. And I know you can. I know everything's Googleable. Um, but please don't. And this is our final answer. So now we know that the distance between those two points is the square root of 106 which is a number that has no meaning to me, except I can go, oh, well, square root of 100 would be 10. So this number is a little over 10 units. Yay! The distance formula. Memorize it right here. You don't necessarily have to be re to recreate this whole thing that I did, but know that this is a mashup of slope formula and Pythagorean. You take the form of Pythagorean, and then you substitute those in for A and B. Okay? Let's do the other part. Part B is a tie-in to the science world. This is a connection to, it's, it's for sure chemistry and physics. 
and probably some others. It's a formula called PV equals NRT. Oh, that looks hard and scary, doesn't it? But it's not. The calculation, I will tell you just enough to be dangerous. That's my, that's my MO with science. I'm not gonna explain to you the real science behind it. I'm just gonna give you enough to be dangerous. This is not a science class. My hope and John's deepest desire is that when you get to the science classes and you run into this kind of calculation, you'll be like, oh, I know how to do this math. And all the other students in your class will flock to you and say, how do you know how to do this? And you'll say, oh, you know, just my natural instinct. So each one of these is a separate variable. And very often in these calculations, we get four and we're solving for the fifth. So let me just quickly tell you what they stand for. P equals pressure. And the typical unit for that is something called atmospheres. So whenever you see atmospheres, you know, oh, that number's a pressure, it goes into the P spot. V equals volume. And that is usually measured in liters. So again, if you see a number 56 liters, you know, oh, okay, that's the volume. Um, N equals the number of moles in a gas. I believe this is all about gas. This PV NRT is about gases. Okay, you know, solid, liquid, gas. Um, okay, R is a constant. Okay, just as we occasionally have in types of problems, it just it's just a number that needs to be in there to make everything come out right, and you don't have to calculate it. John will actually remind you of it, I think, in just about every problem. 0 0.0821, okay? He'll say R equals that. So you just plug it in. T is temperature. And that is not measured in Celsius or Fahrenheit. It's measured in Kelvins, lowercase k. All right, so when we're doing the problems, we just have to sort this all out and figure out which number matches with which letter, and these units often are helpful in doing that. We have two of these problems we're gonna push through. They're not bad. I don't think these problems are too bad. Um, what is helpful, though, is that when we tackle one of these problems, instead of plugging in the numbers here and then doing algebra on the numbers, we rearrange the letters first, kind of like it's an abstract problem, and we get the one that we have to solve for by itself. I'll show you what I mean. But that's a great tip is to rearrange the formula first. That's my tip to you. Let's try the first one, and you'll see what I mean. Example, 88.2. And I think I told you there's only two problems in this section. Use the relationship PV equals NRT. Everything's uppercase except for this N is lowercase. That's just the way it's done in chemistry. Don't ask me to explain the scientist. I can't think like a scientist. Um, to find the number of moles. That's this one. N stands for the number of moles. And then it gives us a bunch of information about numbers. So our first step is to rearrange the formula for the desired variable. What I can see is that we're gonna need to divide both sides by RT, right? So that means that when we're trying to solve for N, that all cancels. I'm bringing, I'm flipping them on the sides. N will equal PV over RT. That way we don't have to do a bunch of algebra with crazy numbers. Two, 
we plug in the numbers. And so I'm going to make a list here. Um, we're going to need, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to set my buckets up right away. And please use buckets. I know they're not really called buckets. They're called parentheses. They do have a name, but I always think of them as buckets because they're, how would you carry water if you didn't have a bucket? What are you going to do? Carry it in your hands? It's impossible. And the bucket is a very useful and clever convenience that allows us to carry the water to, from where we get it to where we want it. That's exactly how parentheses work. They make it easier for us to carry the numbers into the calculation without messing them up. So now, I'm not gonna make a list of these. I'm just gonna plug them right in as I read them. Ready? The temperature is 273 Kelvins. Okay, it tells me temperature, but it also tells me Kelvins. T goes down here, 273. The pressure is one atmosphere. That's P. Um, the volume is eight liters. There's V. And, and then he says in parentheses, R equals 0 0.0821. Okay? So you don't have to memorize that number. You don't have to know what it means. It's just a constant that shows up on these problems, and it goes by the letter R, like I told you before. All right, and here's the good news. John does not require us to pick up our calculators and grind through the numbers, although we could easily, couldn't we? Calculators are not the devil's tool, always. Sometimes they are, but not always. Okay, so if John did want you to reduce this to a single digit, you could use a calculator. I would not expect you to do that by hand. And then let's do the last one. 88.3. Use the formula PV equals NRT to find the volume. Okay, so this time it's the volume that we want. So I'm going to divide both sides by P and I'm going to get V equals NRT divided by P and then I'm going to go V equals, and then I'm going to have three things on the top, one on the bottom. Now I'm ready to go to the part of the book that tells me all these numbers. Ready? Oh, the one thing I should do is put a um, unit on the ending answer. And all we have to do is just go back to our list. This And our answer is in N. N is the number of moles, so I can write this many, I'll write it over here, moles. You do not have to understand what that means to write that word there. You are licensed to label. Okay, ready? Let's go back and figure out these words. Okay, um, we're trying to find the volume of 0 0.832 mole of a gas. Okay, that we know, the mole is the N. So that's here, 0 0.832. At a pressure of three atmospheres, pressure's on the bottom, and a temperature of 400 Ks. Oh, there's our T. And then he writes R equals 0 0.0821, okay? That's always written at the end of the problem. Let me just show you what it looks like. See how, here's, it's in this one too, both of these. He gives all of this number and you're going along and you're picking out all these numbers and making sure the units match and you get to the end and then very unceremoniously, he just says R equals that. That's the one that's the constant, right? So just remind yourself that he's just gonna drop that information in at the end, and he's not gonna include that in this part. Here he does it again down here, right? Here's all the fancy explaining it all, and then just R at the end. So sometimes students go, ah, R, what's R? And that's all it is. 
Okay, this could be the answer. Remember that volume is measured in liters, but John in this case suggested that we run this through and get a final answer, and we get that the volume equals 9.11 liters, and so we can use that as an answer too. Okay, I'm okay. with using the answer to calculate if, wait, I didn't say that right. I'm okay with you using a calculator to calculate the final answer here, as we did here, if John requires a simplified answer in his, when he get, you know, in the answer book, in the solutions manual or the back of your textbook. If John gives you this, then you're done. You don't have to keep going. But if you've got this much, and then you look and see John gives you a nice, tiny little answer like that, then grab your calculator and grind through your numbers and make sure you can get to the same answer. So make your ma answer match his answer. <laughs> I think my broadcasting license should be revoked. Make your answer match to his answer. When you get to this point, check for the answer, see if he left it in this form or if he simplified it with a calculator. If he simplified it with a calculator, you may do so also. If he left it in this form, yay, you're done. And those are the right answers. And speaking of yay, we're done, that is the end. We did both of those problems and that's it. Lesson 88 is done. And you know what else is done? Week 23. Another one bites the dust. Okay, if you are gonna be taking the midterm with me in a couple weeks, make sure that you are memorizing formulas. We just learned another one today. Memorize all your formulas and make sure you know how to do these problems. These lessons that we've done here since the beginning of the year, hard stuff. If you are struggling or having any kind of drama or deep dislike, of those problems, either work on them yourself or ask me to explain a little bit more. You can also go back and look at those lessons, although I can't imagine many people are watching my videos more than once. I mean, the first time, sure, they're entertaining, right? You can see if I make mistakes and see what I have to scribble out each time, but you can watch them over and over and over and over. Use them for ASMR videos. Use them to help you fall asleep at night. Wouldn't that be amazing? Okay, I'm done. Lesson 88 is over. Goodbye.